how Independent Diplomat came about was that uh, I was a British diplomat for many years, 15 years. I resigned over the Iraq War. Um, I founded Independent Diplomat after I quit. And the idea was something that I'd seen in my diplomatic career a lot, which was that many of the countries and groups uh, we were negotiating with as British diplomats, whether on the UN Security Council or elsewhere, were, it seemed to me, very ill-equipped to compete fairly with powerful countries like my own. What do you have to offer your clients? Um, uh, 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 expertise, um, the ability to take their problem, look at it from inside the box. Um, we are staffed by former diplomats um, and other experts in international relations who have worked with powerful countries inside the diplomatic system. Um, and so we take that expertise and experience and put it to work uh, uh, to the benefit of our clients. And we advise them how to work a machine that is very much, often very much, set against the powerless and the marginalized to best influence that machine and get their interests addressed. Um, we will, that's through strategic advice, it's through specific advice on how to handle a particular meeting, who to target with a lobbying campaign, what are the kind of messages that work best in places like the UN, the European Union, or with individual countries bilaterally. Uh, it's what, in a way, I did as a British diplomat for my ministers um, what, what I'm trying to do with Independent Diplomat is establish a service that provides the quality of advice and support and resources to marginalized actors that uh, powerful countries have. That's a big ambition, but it's, it's, we're, we're on our way to achieving it. We advise regular countries. Uh, we're advising a, a big Southeast European country on its EU accession process. We also advise uh, three different governments in Africa. We advise the Polisario Front, which represents the people of the Western Sahara. We advise the government of Southern Sudan, uh, which is, shares government uh, of Sudan under the Comprehensive Peace Agreement. And in the referendum June, June next year, um, there will be a, a referendum on self-determination uh, for the South. And we also advise the government of Somaliland, which is a democratic but unrecognized state in the north of Somalia. Those are our projects in Africa. We also advise the government of Northern Cyprus in the UN negotiations to re reunify that island. We advise the democratic opposition in Burma. Um, we advise a couple of small island states in the climate change negotiations, which are, as everybody knows, uh, where the odds are very heavily stacked against those countries who are most affected and most vulnerable to the effects of climate change and yet have the least sway over the negotiations because they are small countries and often low-lying states, like the island states we are, we are advising. What is your view about sort of the most important thing that should change at the United Nations? Uh, it's a good question because it's not the thing that most people talk about. Most people talk about reform in the sense of making the Security Council bigger and more representative of the new powers in the world. I'm all in favor of that, though I think in many ways it will make the Security Council an even harder place to, to reach good, firm decisions. But my, uh, my favored reform is, is much simpler, which is that the UN and places like the Security Council in particular should allow uh, access and uh, the right of address to those people affected by their decisions, even if they're not governments. The, the UN is a group of governments. And yet, 70% of the issues on the Security Council's agenda involve so-called non-state actors, um, guerrilla groups, uh, 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 regional groups, um, uh, people who want self-determination, a great many who don't fit into the category of normal governments. And yet, these are the people who are often most involved in conflict. They're not given any right of access to the Security Council. They are very infrequently consulted. It seems to me a very basic and easy reform for the UN to institute to give those people regular access. You don't necessarily give them decision-making power, but you give them the right to put their views. And this would help inform decision-making at the UN, in the Security Council in particular, and thus improve it. But there's a gross dis disconnection between diplomats and the people they're supposed to represent, e even in democracies. I realized when I was in the foreign ministry, uh, and Britain is a, a reasonably democratic country, that uh, we would not consult our citizens or parliamentarians, frankly, on what policy should be, uh, we would often make it up according to a very narrow set of criteria of what we were led to believe was important, things like national interests, 
uh, trade, security, very standard traditional uh, measures of, of what a state's interest should be. And while these things are important, I don't think they are the only thing that should determine a country's policy in any given situation. Uh, and I think there is a more humane and uh, um, cosmopolitan aspect to the way ordinary people think about other countries, which is often ignored in foreign policy. Uh, and I, uh, I think that the way negotiations happen in places like the UN often compounds these difficulties of, of national diplomats. Uh, the, the negotiations that happen in places like New York, often about conflicts a very, very long way away, are grossly dissociated from those conflicts. And the realities of those conflicts, and above all the people participating in them, uh, are not given a place at the table. And this is very much the impetus behind Independent Diplomat. How do, you, how do um, other diplomats see you now? Uh, well, at first I thought they'd be very hostile to Independent Diplomat because we were inevitably outside the machine, but in fact, uh, to my surprise, other diplomats have been very accepting of our work, uh, largely because A, we, we know how diplomats work, but B, uh, diplomats in powerful countries are interested in what our clients think. They want to know what the Kosovars, the Southern Sudanese, the Polisario think, and it's remarkable how often they don't really know that, um, that these marginalised actors, though crucial, in these political processes are often ignored by conventional diplomacy.